everyone. Welcome to Science Friday. Here's some for E as well. The one on the top here is one of the ways that you can define E. What makes a field more likely to have an unbalanced gender distribution? So this can be like, in the case of this paper, gyrification or brain fold. A neuroscientist started to look at the brain of uh, like the Thank you, Lauren. Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael. I'm in 10th grade. Today, I'm going to be presenting on some novel modeling of cancer tumor growth, how cancer can grow inside our bodies and how we can better model that on the outside. So before we get started, it's important to ask the question, what is cancer? Many of us probably know that cancer is a disease, it's incredibly costly, and it affects people all over the world. But how does it actually happen? What does it do to our bodies? A greatly oversimplified answer to this question is that cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. Cancer occurs when your cells are mutated and they sometimes change shape and they begin, they begin to grow. And there are no controls on how frequently they divide, how frequently they reproduce, and how frequently they spread. So to get a visual for this, here is what a cancer tumor might look like. Obviously, a cancer tumor is not composed of random shapes, but let's say that each of these shapes represents a kind of cell. And let's compare this to a very orderly cluster of normal cells. Let's say those squares are skin cells. They're forming an orderly lattice, and together they're going to be able to protect your skin so that a bunch of random outside matter can't get through. But if those cells mutate and begin to grow out of control, they form a tumor, which looks a little bit more like this. And as you can see, its structure is all over the place. It's much too big, and it is not going to be functioning like a proper cluster of skin cells. And as these tumors grow, what they can do is spread and attack other healthy regions of the body through a process known as metastasis. So cancer that does this is known as metastatic cancer. The way this works is that one of these cancerous cells is going to go over and attack a healthy cluster of cells, like these skin cells. And once this occurs, it is going to grow uncontrollably, since that, what, that is what cancer is. So it's going to grow, it's going to reproduce, and over time, these healthier skin cells are going to die off, and so now you have a higher population of unhealthy cancerous cells. They're going to continue to grow, continue to mutate, and continue to differentiate. And now we have this unorderly mess, and this isn't going to function nearly as well because the orderly lattice has been disrupted. Instead, we have another tumor growing, and thus the function of this organ, in this case, this patch of skin, is interrupted. And this can happen anywhere in the body. A tumor can form anywhere out of any kind of cell. And it can spread too. So for instance, if I have a tumor in my arm, OK, the skin in my arm is not going to be able to function as well. But that tumor can also spread to anywhere, including my lungs, my brain, my heart. And what if something goes wrong there? That wouldn't be good. And this is how cancer becomes so difficult to treat and so difficult to live with, is because once it reaches a certain stage, it metastasizes and spreads all across the body. And the toll of this is staggering. According to the Globacan 2020 International Agency for Research on Cancer, and with similar figures from the WHO, 19.3 million new cancer cases occurred in 2020. That's a huge number. And during 2020, since coronavirus was dominating a lot of the headlines, fewer cancer cases were likely reported as well because people weren't seeing their doctors. And this doesn't even include cancer cases that had originated in years before 2020 and were simply still ongoing. All of these cases are new. And the death toll is equally, if not more staggering. 10 million people died of cancer during 2020. 10 million. That's a massive number. And to put this in perspective, here in the United States, the coronavirus pandemic, it affected all of our lives and it really ravaged our population. And yet, more people died in 2020 due to cancer than coronavirus. It is killing people every single year and it can affect anyone. I've been affected by cancer and the terrible toll it can take. Over winter break, I lost a close family member, my grandmother, due to a case of renal cell carcinoma, which is a kind of kidney cancer. She was diagnosed 
six or seven months before she passed away, and her cancer had already metastasized or spread to some of her other organs, such as her lungs. And despite trying lots of different treatments, none of them worked, the side effects were too great, and she passed away. During that time, I got to learn a lot more about cancer and how it can hurt people, but also all of the great work that we're doing to try to make it better. And I've gained a deeper understanding of cancer and how we can try to make it a little bit better. So, cancer stem cells are a vital component of cancer. Any treatment that is going to address cancer has to address cancer stem cells. So, in this model of a tumor here, we have lots of different kinds of cells. Let's say we have oval cells, cloud cells, and we have these circular cells. And let's pretend that those circular cells are cancer stem cells. They're highlighted here in red. And cancer stem cells have some really nasty properties, one of which is that they are extremely adaptable. And this extreme adaptability makes them a deadly component of cancer. So let's use a visual to look at how this works. Here is a cancer stem cell. It is living in this tumor, and this tumor is growing, and it is fighting your immune system. And so every now and then, the tumor is going to need different kinds of cells in order to continue to grow. Or your immune system is going to be able to kill some of these, let's say, the cloud cells. So you need to replenish more of them. What cancer stem cells can do is essentially transform themselves and reinvent themselves as any kind of cancer cell. So this circle can become one of the oval-shaped cells. Or if the circle wants to, it can also become one of the cloud-shaped cells. It can fill pretty much any role that this tumor needs in order to survive and thrive in a patient's body. And thus, a high concentration of cancer stem cells means that a tumor is going to be really resilient, really hard to take out, and it's going to grow and spread a lot faster. So this should make it really clear. Any drug, any treatment we want to use that is going to address cancer needs to be able to deal with cancer stem cells. These are the three main batches of treatment that we have for cancer right now. Surgery, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. And each one has its pros and cons. Surgery is probably the most intuitive, um, and the classic example where surgery can be used to treat cancer involves breast cancer, where if a tumor is detected in a patient's breast, they can have that breast removed using a treatment called a mastectomy have all or part of a breast removed. And if you can successfully take out that organ and you can get rid of all of the cancer cells along with it, then you've gotten rid of the cancer. Great. But there's lots of problems with this approach. For starters, surgery has trouble targeting smaller growths of cancer that are harder to identify and harder to excavate. And so it's going to be less effective there. Additionally, surgery is invasive. People don't want to have to undergo surgery all the time. And if a, if a tumor is in a place where surgery is hard to do, like a heart or a lung or a brain, then surgery is not an effective tool. And finally, if the cancer has already metastasized and spread throughout your entire body, surgery is ineffective because you cannot just try to remove organs every single place cancer pops up. That's untenable. And so as a result, while surgery has promise, it definitely isn't a catch-all. Chemotherapy refers to a class of drugs that target cells and very effectively kill them. And so if chemotherapy is added to a region where a cancer tumor is growing, then it is going to seek to kill out those cancer tumor, tumor cells. And it's very effective at doing this. The main problem of chemotherapy is that it also targets all of the cells around the tumor. Chemotherapy is indiscriminate and it's sort of like an antibiotic. It just kills everything. And because the collateral damage caused by a chemotherapy dose is so high, it has to be used sparingly. As a matter of a fact, chemotherapy can even damage and mutate healthy cells so badly that they can form another kind of cancer, known as a secondary cancer. So if you can overuse chemotherapy, you can get another cancer. Thus, chemotherapy is not very effective against metastatic cancer, since you cannot inflict so much pain onto your body's cells by indiscriminately bombarding them with chemotherapy if cancer keeps popping up one after another all across your body. The newest kind of treatment for a cancer that has been developed is immunotherapy. And it works in a similar way to chemotherapy, except it is much more discriminate. 
and less ruthless. In other words, it is going to seek out cancer cells and try to kill them. The way that it does this is by looking for and binding to receptors on the surface of a cancerous cell. So a receptor is a little protein that's on the outside of the cell, and your immunotherapy drug will bind with it and then kill the cancer. Immunotherapy shows a lot of promise, but it is only effective against cancers that have receptors that can easily be identified. If the cancer's receptor is not obvious, the immunotherapy drug might not work. Additionally, cancers evolve all the time. Every time a cell divides, there is a chance that it mutates and a new trait can be added. And since cancer is all about uncontrolled cell growth, that means it's going to be dividing all the time and has many more opportunities to mutate. And so as a result, when a cancer mutates, it can suddenly become resistant to immunotherapy. So researching cancer is also really difficult, and I have a little bit of a graphic to represent this. So this is little Timmy. He's a stick figure. He's enjoying a normal stick figure life. But uh-oh, it looks like he's developed lung cancer. There are some cancer cells in his lungs. That's really unfortunate. So little Timmy will probably try out all of the various treatments available to him, but surgery might not be effective because it's in his lungs. It's hard to get out the entire tumor. You can probably only get out a little bit. Chemotherapy might not work. And let's say that the cancer has developed resistance to immunotherapy. Now what? It's clear that this cancer is posing a problem and further research needs to be done. So here we have a researcher who wants to learn more about little Timmy's cancer. In order to do that, what does the researcher have to do? The researcher has to go and meet up with little Timmy in the hospital and perform surgery in order to take out just a little bit of little Timmy's tumor. And then after the researcher brings back a snippet of the tumor to his lab, since there isn't enough cell growth, he will probably grow more of it. And voila, he has a model. This is a model of the cancer going on inside little Timmy's cell. This is great, but it raises a question. Are these two cancers the same thing? Is the researcher's model actually comparable to what is going on inside little Timmy? If it is, great. But what if it's not? In that case, if a researcher finds a drug that shows great promise against his model, it might not even work inside of a human or little Timmy. It is imperative that this model be near equivalent to the actual cells that are growing inside of a patient. Because if it is not, the model isn't useful. It's misleading. Because the researcher took out only a little bit of the tumor, there's probably less cell variation, so they didn't get a full sample. And there are also potentially fewer cancer stem cells if the researcher did not take explicit care in order to make sure there was a high concentration. Whereas in a tumor inside of a patient, there's going to be lots of cell variation, just like there's lots of cells. And there are going to be many more cancer stem cells in the entire tumor. So this problem, making models that are more accurate and when compared to what is going on inside of a patient is what the research paper I am presenting on seeks to address. It is titled, Inhibiting Wint and Notch in Renal Cancer Stem Cells and the Implications for Human Patients. This isn't a great title. I wouldn't read too much into it. The novelty of this paper lies in the techniques that it advocates are better for modeling cancer in a test tube. And so what the researchers tried to do was they used renal cell carcinoma. They had some patients undergo surgery and took out little bits of their tumor, which they grew in their lab. And then they tried to isolate populations of cancer stem cells in order to make sure their models had a high concentration of these deadly stem cells. And so you can see the results of that in this graph. It looks a little bit intimidating, so let's go ahead and break it down. The x-axis of the left graph is CXCR4, APC. And all that this is, is this is a indicator of the presence of cancer stem cells. So the more of this you have, the farther down the x-axis you go, the more cancer stem cells are going to be present. And then Met Pacific Blue is going to not only indicate for cancer stem cells, but help stain them so that you can visualize them on a graph like this or in a Petri dish. And so the participants of this study have identified this boxed region as having a high concentration of cancer stem cells. And there is a lot of the indicator CXCR4 APC. And upon isolating most of those cells, along with some others, they created the graph on the right. The x-axis has changed. It is now CD44. That's just another 
indicator that cancer stem cells are present. So they have roughly the same function. And side scatter, which is the y-axis, again, helps show where the cells are in the petri dish. It's an it is a staining agent. And so as you can see, based on these numbers, 8.5 and 5.8, there's a high concentration of cancer stem cells here. But once they isolated it and allowed it to probably grow for a little bit, since this procedure takes time, there are fewer. What might have happened? The cancer stem cells probably differentiated and transformed into different kinds of cells that this tumor needs in order to thrive. Now, why is this relevant? Why do these cancer stem cells matter in terms of modeling cancer? This graph provides insights into that. So here we have CXCR4, MET, and CD44. As I mentioned earlier, these are all indicators of a high concentration of cancer stem cells. And so the cell cultures that are shown in the red lines are indicator positive. That means they do have a high concentration of cancer stem cells. While the cell growths in the blue lines are negative for these indicators. That means they don't have nearly as many of these deadly cancer stem cells. The x-axis of this graph is cells per well. This simply shows how many cancer cells are in each little well of cells. And a well is just a miniature petri dish, essentially, of cells. And the y-axis is really interesting. Percentage of wells with spheres. OK, so what are spheres and why does this matter? A sphere indicates that these cancer cells have formed a complex three-dimensional shape. They're no longer just a flat blanket along a cell well or a petri dish, they formed a three-dimensional sphere. And since the shape of a cell or an organoid indicates its function, this implies that these tumors are going to be a lot more advanced. And this is more consistent as to what is happening inside of a patient. And so as you can see, when there are more cancer stem cells, far more of these complex and diverse cancer sphere organoids form. And so what does that mean? Let's visualize this. This is what a sphere culture might look like. This is obviously not a picture, it's a drawing. But it nonetheless shows that you have a clump of lots of different kinds of cells that have been grown inside this petri dish using cells taken from a human with renal cell carcinoma. On the right, we have an organoid culture. And it is very similar, except instead of having little spheres that are spread across the petri dish, you have sort of a three-dimensional mound in the petri dish. Both of these are going to have a high variation of cells. Both of them have been shown in the previous two graphs to have a high concentration of cancer stem cells. What the researchers are trying to show is that these models are better models as to what is going on inside of a patient than just taking cancer cells out and putting them on a petri dish. By taking care to isolate the cancer stem cells and then by cultivating these complex three-dimensional shapes, we can get a better model of what is going on inside a patient. Now, how could these tumor models be tested? What's a good way for us to know whether these models are actually analogous to what is going on inside of a patient? Think about it for a second. Talk to the person next to you, and we'll see what you come up with. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious. All right, maybe 30 more seconds. All right, so who has an idea they'd be willing to share of how these tumor models can be tested? Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, Aura.
OK, what metrics would that be? If you repeat what you just said so that everybody Oh, sure, yeah. So or suggested if you did a deeper lab analysis of various metrics of both the renal cell carcinoma inside the kidney and these three-dimensional models, you could get a better idea of how they compare. What metrics specifically? Do you have any ideas? What help? Okay, so the rate of differentiation for stem cells, that's a good idea. Um, anything else? Um, Kayla? Um, maybe you could find like, some treatment for the culture that like, inhibits cell growth or something, and if it works on that, then you can try it out on your human specimen, and then I guess that would be like, a way to tell if it was like, an effective model. Okay, I like that idea, and the researchers liked that idea as well. But in order, um, Kayla suggested that in order to test these tumor models, you could basically treat these um, sphere and organoid cultures with a treatment that is known to work inside of a patient, and then compare the results. And that's basically right on the nose. That's exactly what the researchers did. And so they used a treatment that involves inhibiting Wnt and Notch signaling. So Wnt and Notch signaling are basically ways in which cells communicate with each other, and they are they just help cells coordinate what they're doing and communicate. The function of them isn't important, but what's important to know is that it has already been shown that when Wnt and Notch are inhibited in a patient, the size of their tumor decreases. And so thus, it is seen as a relatively effective treatment. And so that is what the researchers did was they both stimulated and they inhibited the Wnt and Notch signaling of sphere cultures and organoid cultures. So first they applied, I believe it's a protein called beta-catenin, which will stimulate these signals, and then they inhibited it and measured the size of the cells. So this graph shows organoid cultures which have been inhibited for Wnt and Notch signaling. So the axes are ICG001, this will, when applied, this will inhibit Wnt signaling. So the more of this you have, the less Wnt signaling you will have. And the x-axis over there is DAPT. That does the same thing, but for notch signaling. So these are inhibitors. The more of them, more inhibition. The y-axis percent of organoids shows how many of these organoid cells were able to survive this inhibition. As you can see, the more inhibition occurred, many fewer organoids were able to survive. And the tumor size decreased. And with the notch signaling inhibitor, DAPT, the size of the tumors, the percentage of organoids also decreased, although the effect is much less pronounced. And so what does this mean? These organoids have responded in a really similar way to what the patient would. And this implies that they modeled this treatment correctly. And so thus, these more complex, cancer stem cell rich 3D models have a lot of promise in order to model what is actually going on inside a patient. So let's ground this again back where we started in the terrifying death toll of cancer. My, this paper presents better cancer modeling using three-dimensional sphere cultures and organoid cultures with a high concentration of cancer stem cells. And it has shown that they're able to effectively model what is going on inside of a patient for renal cell carcinoma. If we have better cancer modeling, that opens up a new host of possibilities in the cancer field. It's going to make cancer research a lot easier. As I showed earlier, researching on a patient is really difficult because there are lots of ethical considerations. You don't want to harm the patient. You don't want to do anything that isn't in the patient's best interests, and it's logistically challenging. But if you're working with a test tube, most of those considerations aren't there. If I accidentally kill all my bacteria, that's OK. I'll have to get new ones. but. There's no major ethical ramification as if I accidentally hurt a human in a clinical trial. And if we can, this means it's going to be a lot easier, a lot more cost effective, and a lot more time efficient in order to research cancer. That means all of the billions of dollars we have thrown at cancer and all of the countless hours we have spent are going to go farther. And the hope is that that is going to lead to better outcomes, to improved treatments. And hopefully, if we can make these treatments better by making it easier to model cancer, we're going to be able to lower the staggering death tolls that I showed earlier. Thank you.